And so, without further ado, while uh, you prepare to come up to the podium, um, I've been asked to introduce you, but really you do not need any introduction. The Minister has been with us for many years, previously as Minister of Finance for two rounds, and he is currently a Member of Parliament, and he is the current Minister of Public Enterprises. He is what he calls himself, not a politician, but a political activist, and uh, we have had the honor of feeling his activism in all the areas that he has touched in our lives in South Africa as a political activist and a member of parliament. And um, we thank you, Minister, for honoring us with your presence today. Uh, we are very anticip anti anticipative. There's huge excitement uh, in the room in terms of your delivery, and we look forward to what you are about to share with us. Without further ado, please come to the podium. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for getting up a little bit early, particularly for those of us who come from Pretoria uh, to be here on time. And thanks to the BBC leadership for this opportunity to uh, interact with you. Uh, <coughs> and I see you like uh, DPE, and forgive me for coughing, um, I have a bit of a cold. So like DPE, the BBC is also in Hollywood or Bollywood or Nollywood mode. Uh, lots of acting people. But I suppose that's the, the phase that we are in. So acting president, secretary general, CEO, vice, uh, deputy vice president, uh, or rather vice president, thank you very much for this opportunity and, and your early, earlier briefing as, as well. I think we meet in an interesting context, a context where our country and all of its key entities are in this transition mode between uh, a period that we'd all like to forget someday and record in our histories as a period when we let ourselves down very seriously and let down the founders of our democracy and a period ahead of us let's call it the beginnings of the new dawn, in which we can say that we've positioned all of us to uh, fulfill and achieve the true potential that we have as a country. All the remarks made until now indicate that uh, there's a lot that we can offer as South Africans both to ourselves, uh, to the African continent, and indeed to the world as well, if, we're, if we put ourselves on, on, the, on the right track. But to do that, and this will be one of my key messages this morning, we can't be voluntarily bystanders. So I know the term was used by the acting president earlier on, but many of us are quite happy to let others do the hard work and uh, get into the front lines of the battles that had to be fought and they will still have to be fought. Because let's not bluff ourselves. This transition is a contested transition. It's a transition in which those who have abused uh, their access uh, created by themselves to state-owned entities and other institutions are not just handing you the keys and saying, take over. They're actually fighting back in various forms. <clears throat> and various narratives will be created. You know, from I've been treated badly, or I was kicked off a board, uh, to I'm being marginalized, et cetera, et cetera. But it goes a little bit worse than that. Uh, there are those who still sit in office who will utilize the powers and uh, instruments of that office to advance uh, what was the extraction process that I will describe briefly in a, in a moment. The acting president is absolutely right, Mr. Musima, that uh, over, over the last 10 years, we've also let ourselves down fiscally. Uh, indeed, the state and its fiscus became an ATM. Now, if it was an ATM for a good purpose, that's a different thing. But this was an ATM which had a direct link to accounts in Dubai and elsewhere. So you extract from this ATM and you put it into another one. And uh, so, forgive me, but I'm going to be very frank uh, about the nature of the issues that we actually face. 
because otherwise we're too polite, and I don't intend to be rude, uh, then we, do, we miss the, 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 the seriousness, if you like, of, of where we are. Similarly, I think it's, it's very important that as business and its various components, you do unite and find a common agenda. And that business within its own ranks needs to come up with a common formulation of what does radical transformation or urgent transformation or accelerated transformation, as I would call it, mean in our, in our current context. And what would be the milestones that we would put? What would be the key performance areas that we would identify? And what are the indicators by which we will judge whether we're making progress or not uh, in this particular regard? My last introductory point is that we often say, you know, 24 years of democracy, look where we are, 3% of the economy, as the CEO was saying. <clears throat> but the smaller struggle that I mentioned just now is in fact part of a bigger struggle. It's part of the process of changing a racist past, an oppressive past, and a non-inclusive past, into an inclusive uh, future, and one in which not just us as elites who sit in these rooms, but 55 million people become the beneficiaries of the changes that we want to bring about. And I think the challenge for all of us is going to be what, what I would call the massification, is a point I will come back to later, uh, of the benefits of controlling uh, state power, uh, of being able to participate in a democracy, both in, as citizens, but as business people and professionals as well. So nobody's gonna hand things to us. We'll have to create the gibbs of the world and multiply them many times over. We must get out there and be able to compete. In the last 10 days, but for some odd reason, I've been meeting a number of global firms <coughs> who have an interest and uh, often as South Africans, we let ourselves down. And I always thought they're gonna come to me and say, you know, you've got lousy skills in this country, forgive the language, you don't have enough skilled people, you don't have uh, much IP to offer, etc." The contrary was in fact the case. They're saying you have skills. We'd like to utilize those skills. In fact, at the moment, as I'm sure many of you know, many countries in the Middle East are actually stealing our skills. Uh, part of the process of state capture was also stealing our intellectual property and exporting it free of charge uh, to other centers as well, whereas we should be the ones who are benefiting from that process. So what is the role of uh, the SOE sector in, in our economy? Clearly, uh, Many of the utilities and uh, logistics entities like Transnet and Eskom are absolutely central to our economy. Uh, in 2008, 9 we saw what load shedding did. Uh, load shedding resulted in a percent to a percent and a half of GDP uh, being deducted from our economic performance. And I must say on, on behalf of, uh, of Eskom, that whilst they've been giving you notice that there might be load shedding and you think it must be happening somewhere else, the report I have as of last night is that despite those uh, warnings, in fact, notwithstanding what happened last Thursday and Friday at Eskom and the very tough recovery process that Eskom is going through now as a result of the shutdown of so many power stations or the units, there's been in the last few days no load shedding. Uh, so they've done a brilliant job at uh, maintaining the electricity supply and hopefully very soon, in the next three or four days, they'll be able to tell all of us that they've actually reached a point of stability if there's no other untoward events. Similarly, Transnet is the key purveyor of uh, our mineral resources that constitute a very big part of our exports. Now, there's another side of the story. Why are we exporting raw, mate raw, uh, raw materials and uh, unbeneficiated resources? But whether we like it or not at the moment, uh, Transnet services, both in terms of rail and port facilities, 
and the efficiencies of those facilities are absolutely critical, both for the manufacturing sector, but also for the mining and agricultural sector as, as, as well. So these are just two examples of the critical role that these SOEs play. We expect that these are also entities that deliver key services, like, like electricity. But if you go beyond our portfolio, water boards throughout the country and water authorities throughout the country play a critical role in ensuring that there is drinkable or potable water. Um, more importantly, that as we give mining licenses, that the water licenses are also issued. But there too we have a crisis because for reasons that you can work out, uh, the Water Trading Authority over the last few years somehow lost two to three billion runs. Uh, TCTA, which was a very efficient infrastructure delivery entity that those of you that are in the engineering field will know, uh, is, is facing certain deficits at the moment because it's not receiving money uh, from the Water Trading Authority, which is likely not to be receiving money from municipalities which is not receiving money from consumers. So whilst we talk at a narrower level uh, in this kind of context, there's a broader context. And the broader context is uh, not for debate today, but one that you need to be aware of. What is the compliance culture in our country in terms of either paying taxes, I'm no longer commissioner, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, otherwise, I'll be taking your car registration numbers outside. <coughs> We made a lot of money that way, by the way, in those years. Um, so it, it, these things matter in terms of getting an efficient economy going. Similarly, investing in infrastructure, as, as your sponsor, uh, Mr. DeFries said earlier on, is critical. But what is happening at the moment? Because of the bad business management, is resulting in a bad financial situation within SOEs which mean that liquidity and other issues are being confronted uh, in, in these entities. And what's happening? Capital investment is being cut down. And that then has an impact on the construction industry, on the professionals involved in the construction industry. So the real impact, as you will see as I go further down the presentation, mm -hmm. is actually on ordinary businesses at the end of the day, of the mismanagement and the capture of state institutions. Research is, is also a critical area. There's some fascinating work going on in Transnet Rail, for example, that we were exposed to about 10 days ago. Young people, uh, black professionals, but also this was a non-racial team, truly reflective of South Africa. Probably our average age uh, of 35, not 70. Uh, but coming up with innovative ideas to cut costs, to introduce efficiencies, working with scientists in the CSIR and engineers in Transnet Rail, which again displayed the kind of potential that we have as a country. Yet, are we investing enough as a country in R&D? We're not. The last number I remember is 0.7% of GDP uh, versus the world benchmark of 1.5% of GDP. So, we have the scientists, and I think we have the capability, but we aren't doing enough, both as the private sector and as the public sector as well. Something for the BBC to think about as a legacy for younger members, as you in the executive get older as well. Uh, you see, I can also have the opportunity to pick on them. <laughs> uh, the, the, the performance of these entities obviously has the fiscal impact that you indicated, but one also sees, as one visits different facilities amongst these SOCs, the huge potential they have to actually uh, spawn a lot more small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, whether it's engineering firms or component manufacturers and so on, we are not exploiting that potential at all uh, at, at the moment. And uh, on the one hand, you have large numbers of engineers of one kind or another being produced. On the other hand, they have nothing to do. Uh, and, that, that mis and, and of course, we don't have the entrepreneurs, perhaps in the numbers that we actually need them uh, in order to create the businesses that are necessary as well. So SOEs have, have a critical role in our economy. Uh, if you look at the business day this morning, 
uh, on page two, it's a continuation of an article on page one, uh, on the Eskom wage talks. Uh, a gentleman who's quite well known for uh, giving us public notice about his views from Standard and Poor, Mr. Royce, says uh, Eskom is very critical. And what happens in the wage negotiations is equally critical to the credit rating of South Africa. So that gives you another uh, angle into the effects of state capture. I'm sure you used to or will remember some of these uh, headlines, but I thought this collage was also useful to get, just jog your memory a little bit. I mean, how does 19 billion rounds just disappear in Transnet? Eh? If we distributed 19 billion rounds here, yeah, hopefully, let's say all of us are really honest people and really good entrepreneurs. Imagine what you can do with 19 billion rounds. Can you imagine? Eh? And yet, that's the money that's disappeared into a black hole. Let's call it a white hole. I don't know what color, what you have. <laughs> uh, black is a sensitive uh, color. It might even have be red uh, as well. So ask yourselves, where were we when all these things were happening? Those are the very people who stood on this platform talking to you, right? And saying to you, back me. You see, I'm pro BEE, I'm 51%, I'm this and I am that. But that was a facade, a facade which gave cover to the real agenda of state capture. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this report, but this report is a very good uh, encapsulation of the phenomenon of state capture. Let's just say uh, to humor me a little bit. Hands up, those of you that have seen this. You see, I mean, not even 10% of this audience. But find it, it's on the web. This was our reference book produced by some academics, led by Professor Anton Eberhardt. Uh, at the UCT Business School. And I'll show you a little diagram just now. But this, in summary, tells you what happened at ESCO. Similarly, uh, there's a new one on Transnet and what's happen happened and happening uh, at Transnet as, as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. So, the ESCOM process is, is well on its way and I'm not sure how many of you saw an article in the, again in the business day on Monday, in the second uh, half of the business day, describing uh, the Eskom situation with uh, numbers and with facts and figures which are pretty frightening. So you can see I brought all my, all my evidence. I, the program director is a lawyer, so I got to... So this is, this is, this is the... This is the article, read it. It says between 2007 and 2017, top management in Eskom expanded from 80 people to over 400 people. All right. We're still trying to work out what the benefits are. But amongst the benefits at Eskom, I think, is prime minus five for any car or house you want to buy. How many of you would like that? Okay. Uh, but it gives you, so 5% less electricity has been provided by ESCOM during that 10 year period. But staff expanded from 34 or something thousand to 47,000. Yeah, so 13, 14, 15,000 more people, but much less productivity from the same group of people. And I'm sure though, as business people, you know, that's not a way of surviving. Uh, as far as business is concerned. This is the timeline of state capture at ESCOM. It's in that little booklet. Can't go through all of it now, but tells you very accurately which minister came in when, which board changes happened when, which CEO came into office when, and what were the procurement events. You like procurement, so we foc <laughs> they focus on procurement. <laughs> Right? Which procurement events, T-Systems, New Age, etc., 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 which contracts were signed by whom uh, during that whole timeline? Uh, and if you go into the booklet, it, it gives you a clear description of the Tegeta coal contracts, 
of the T-Systems contract, of the Duva boiler uh, acquisition, and so on and so on. Read it. Similarly, you have then Transnet. The locomotives is one example at the moment. And you know the cost increasing from 38 uh, billion odd to 54 billion runs in a very strange kind of way. And over ab and above that, you also know about the commission that all of you would love, 5 billion rounds for doing nothing, all right? That's the effect of state capture. So forget about the 19, if you had 5 billion to spend here uh, to generate small and medium-sized businesses and to put in capital to grow them as professional engineering firms or construction companies or IT companies, eh? how much better off you would be in the last couple of years so state capture and its effects is, is, uh, is not something that sort of hangs out in the air. It's very real uh, and it's affected all of us. Here's the timeline for Transnet. Exactly what happened when, who got appointed when, which contract was signed when, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now remember that through all of this process, lawyers, auditors, consulting firms, Financial entities were part and parcel of the scheme. It didn't just happen. Right? They all collaborated wittingly or unwittingly in, in this process. And none of this, by the way, has been contested in any court of law, just for the record. Because obviously, if this is nonsense, then somebody would contest it, right? It hasn't been. We'll wait for Justice Zondo and the Commission for more revelations and they're going to come. Yeah. Uh, this is a continuation of the timeline. So, amongst other things, as you know, the President has asked the SIU to look into the very issues that I'm actually talking about. The Commission of Inquiry has been established. There's any number of forensic reports that are available. And you had reports available for which you paid as an entity, for example, the one is 18 million rands. And then you say it's too vague. Uh, but so another 18 million must be spent uh, on the same report. But it already identified the individuals that should at least firstly be suspended, secondly be further investigated, and thirdly either disciplined or charged in one way or another, either in terms of the Public Finance Management Act or any other relevant legislation including some of the anti-corruption legislation. So this is where we're going uh, after having learned how some of these phenomena have occurred. Firstly, to strengthen governance uh, in these entities, and you've seen the board changes. And I know the complaint stroke observation, uh, let me stop there, uh, from BBC is, you know, we don't have enough people there, but uh, two of your Senior people are on two boards of the six SOEs. We only have six SOEs in DPE, by the way. I'm sure others are participating in other boards as well. Your issue around uh, the ad advertisement, that advertisement was to actually refresh the database. The old database is obviously contaminated. Uh, looked at the Gu look at the Gupta emails or whatever you want. Uh, you can't rely on, on that database. So it was to refresh, refresh the database so that any further or in future appointments will be made on the basis of, that, uh, of the new database. So anybody is welcome to submit their CVs provided they meet the new criteria. And the old criteria, are you connected to the Guptas, doesn't apply any longer. The new criteria is good governance, integrity, serving the national purpose, and making sure that you serve the interests of the entity. Right? Not, not uh, your personal interest of the person yeah. or the interest of those who have quite nefarious intentions as far as our country is concerned. Um, many of these entities have uh, liquidity challenges. Uh, we've been sweating like hell over the last 10 days to keep, to pay salaries in South African Express in a day's time, for example. So you saw. You might not have seen in the business report this morning that we've given an assurance, we've raised enough money to be able to pay the salaries at the end of the week to the 400 odd people that work at SA Express. Notwithstanding the absolute disaster 
that was created at SA Express. I haven't even gone into that. So if you visit the, I think they call it the hangar, eh, where the planes are, you're going to find engine parts lying all over. Four, how many? Six aircraft, right? Uh, out of the 22 aircraft, only 10 to 12 were flying. Every single day uh, in the recent past, chartered aircraft were used uh, because their own aircraft couldn't fly. You had acting this and acting, so Hollywood also pervaded there, okay? And you had a huge recycling of CEOs, CFOs, board members. We talk about uh, uh, black business. Once we've done our forensics there, I'm afraid uh, our own business people have uh, played the role of middle persons, right? In other words, you have an original equipment manufacturer who can supply a particular part to you at, let's say, $1,000. The middle person will come in and add 750 so you'll pay 1750 for the part. So we're still unraveling all of that. But what does it mean? It means you bring a reasonably good small airline, owned by the state 100%, uh, to its knees. And then the Civil Aviation Authority comes along and says all the things that they've said, and they ground the airline. So uh, the liquidity challenges are quite serious, uh, without which the first thing that a company needs to be able to do, which is to pay its creditors, people like yourselves, and pay the staff, can't actually happen. We will then look at uh, uh, other t sort of immediate uh, turnaround strategies or, or actions that we need to take. So boards have changed, management is being reviewed, some changes have happened, more will happen in, in due course. We will then look at uh, other changes that need to be made, such as what is the mandate of each of these entities, do we need to keep all of them, uh, what are their business and operating models, as I said earlier on, because if a business can't generate enough revenue, then what is it doing? Operating in the way it is currently operating, something needs to give. Something needs to change. And clearly, uh, from a whole of government point of view, as I will show you in a minute, there's also changes in the way uh, oversight must be managed and controlled as well. Uh, I've told you the Eskom story. I've told you the Transnet story. You have a new board. You have these two uh, forensic reports, but the other investigations that are going on as well. So I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember uh, Springbuck Radio. Yeah, there's so few of us around, eh? <coughs> so there was a program there called No Place to Hide. Do you remember? Mark Saxon. Yeah, okay, there's only three shaking heads in the audience. <laughs> so hopefully we are soon going to arrive at a position where there is no place to hide. Where we can, in fairness, say to you as a South African public, but as an interest group as well, that uh, we understand at least 80% of what goes on and went on and uh, what our uh, approach is to actually cleaning up. Similarly, uh, Danell, from a period maybe seven, eight years ago, highly efficient, highly respected in the armaments industry in the world, I met uh, a European firm two days ago that have uh, invested, they, they, they employ, is it 600 workers? Uh, in one of their op joint ventures with Danel in South Africa. They want to expand. They have a very high regard for the scientists and the developers that we have. They have a very high regard for the intellectual property that lies in Danel. And yet, Danel Asia was created in order to export some of that intellectual property. Remember it? And all the squabbles around it. And if you go through the timelines, it's fascinating how on the 14th of December, or was it 14th, uh, 13th, yes, uh, no, no, it's a little bit earlier, 9th, 10th of December, 9th is when Mr. Nene gets told to take a walk, <laughs> right? The 10th is when this memo arrives at the Treasury, please sign, creation of Danel Asia. And the 14th, 13th is when I was asked to walk in, we won't talk about when I was asked to walk out. <laughs> um, but we have a very good board in place there, highly experienced, know the business, and they, uh, uh, 
the CEO has already walked through the exit door, the CFO is suspended and investigations are currently taking place. SA Express I've talked about uh, putting in, one of the things ladies and gentlemen about boards as well, in the boards that we've chosen so far, we've had the right gender mix, we've had the right generational mix, and we must, and I think we've got the right uh, experience and professional mix. The forensics that we've undertaken or others have undertaken, the treasury, the entities themselves, uh, there's piles of them uh, that, are, that are now available. The fascinating thing is nothing's been done about them. So those are all areas that even a depleted department like DPE is beginning to give uh, attention to. ESCOM has done uh, one additional thing under its new board, and that is initiated lifestyle audits. So they're well on the way. It should be completed, I think, in July uh, this year, not next year. And that will begin to tell an interesting story about the relationship between what you earn and the assets that you have, either in your own name or the ones that you are using proxies to hide uh, in one way or another. That's a popular sport in the world as well. Um, procurement is, is obviously the key area that was targeted uh, in the capture process and more importantly in the extraction process. And the involvement of boards directly in procurement was one of the enabling factors that uh, helped uh, people get the tenders, uh, whether it was in Transnet or in other entities as well. And there's legend, uh, legendary records of all of these decisions about how it happened, who participated, and sometimes just a handful, two or three people on a board, together with the collaboration of management, were able to push out huge tenders or change uh, what bid evaluation committees came up with in order that X wouldn't get it and Y would get it at, at, the, at the end of the day. So you heard the president say boards cannot be involved. They can have oversight over the process to make sure it's run properly, but they can't be directly involved in the procurement process itself. Uh, there are several on the payroll, you know, in order to perform specific responsibilities. Uh, which I think you can see if you watch carefully enough. So let me skip all of this. This is one area that, that you've been uh, referring to, which is the supplier development program. But I think we need another interaction where we bring some stats to you, uh, acting president, and say which entity is actually doing what in terms of employment, in terms of training. And there's some phenomenal uh, facilities that we have. At I think it's at Kudaspur, the Transnet Rail. Mm -hmm. You have a college there for training artisans and uh, engineers of one kind or another, and 3,000 people can be trained at a time. Uh, the question is who will absorb them if the economy is not growing. It's part of the challenge as well. The reforms that government is undertaking to uh, put the SOEs right, but hopefully prevent future state capture. There's no guarantees about that as we go ahead. But the, as you know, the, the cabinet has agreed on the creation of a presidential SOE council. This will have <coughs> a number of ministers on it, uh, but also the president will nominate a few uh, people in the form of academics and business and professionals uh, to be also on this council. It has to be small to be effective. Uh, before all of you want to now register to be on the council. Um, and uh, I think what this will enable us to do is to work out a, a different set of parameters for the way in which government as a shareholder has oversight over its entities, looks at the financing of these entities, looks at the business models, cuts out duplication in these entities as well. There's a fair amount of that going on. An example of that is that you have phenomenal uh, expertise and facilities in Transnet Rail, but Prasa is spending four billion rounds doing the same thing near Nigel. Now, what's the logic in that? Both are 100% state-owned. So obviously somebody is creaming something on the, on the one side, uh, to put it politely. So that, that's uh, really improper in, in our kind of environment. But the key also is once we've got 
gone through this transition period and got the basic task of stabilizing these entities through, we can then use the asset base of these entities to leverage uh, borrowing, for example, do more investments in infrastructure, to give more support to small and medium-sized businesses and professionals as well. That might be a little bit way off, but uh, in 1965, when Singapore uh, got its independence from Malaysia, if you look at the record, this is Wikipedia, by the way, so uh, they had an arms manufacturer, they had a water utility and so on. They just grouped all of them and today, 30 years later or so, they have Temasek, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a huge conglomerate, it has the state-owned assets, it's got some private sector participation, but it was able to leverage the balance sheet of the state, so to speak, in order now to invest all over the world and earn returns that can be of benefit to Singapore as a country and to the people of Singapore as well. China is using a slightly different model, uh, but also an interesting one. They had large numbers of SOEs, went through a whole period of experimentation, uh, but, not, but then some of them got into difficulty, so they started shrinking that portfolio. And they have an overarching structure called CASEC, uh, which is the equivalent of Temasek in a different kind of way. But those SOEs have now become global players in terms of procuring uh, other firms in Europe or the United States. We don't know what Mr. Trump is going to do about that. Uh, and you know Mr. Trump, eh? <laughs> um, so th that's enabled China to become a major uh, global player. So there'll be other reforms uh, that will emerge. Let me sum up by saying the following. What are the lessons, and I say so far, because I think there's a lot more lessons <laughs> that we're going to learn as we go on, that uh, you, you require strong institutions like BBC, uh, like other business organizations, civil society organizations, uh, the previous public protector, uh, and the kind of role she played uh, at the time, uh, the judiciary, uh, and other investigative arms as well, uh, all of which were an important set of protection uh, that we had as South Africans against rampant uh, state capture. And the ability uh, of our society to resist some of that depended on these institutions. And one of the things that state capture does is that it destroys institutions. You can spend 10, 20 years building the BBC. You can then have a leadership, not the current one, so please don't attack me. Uh, at some stage, which comes in, does all sorts of funny things, six months later there's no BBC in the form that you know it. So building institutions takes a long time. Destroying institutions can take a few months. And you know that in business as well. Get the wrong CEO in uh, or management team, they take the wrong kinds of risks and that's the end of the story as far as a particular business entity is concerned. Um, we need to continue to uh, focus on, as you said, reindustrialization, uh, really fundamental transformation, the creation of jobs, which we talk about, but there's a lot more to do to give hope to young people, including young professionals in this particular regard as well. And uh, clearly there are areas like procurement, support for small businesses, financing of uh, black business in particular, where a lot more needs to be done in order to give you uh, the muscle that you require to become true participants in, in the economy. What is the cost of state capture and corruption? Well, firstly, it's a stealing, stealing by a few for a few. So whatever the narratives were created, that this is for the benefit of blacks and uh, a benefit for large constituencies. In fact, the, benef the beneficiaries are a very small group of people. Right? Uh, and even in these big institutions, the majority of people are still honest South Africans who are trying to do an honest day's piece of work. But you have a small group of people at the top and sometimes penetrating down, uh, down as well, whose mission in life is to destroy uh, the organize or to steal, regardless of what destructive effects it actually has. Uh, I talked about uh, exporting intellectual property 
and there's a lot of that going on, weakening of institutions, the billions that we've actually lost. I think the calculators haven't finished their work yet. Uh, we say 100 billion, many say it could be well beyond that. And again, I ask you the question, if that money was plugged into development of black business, right, what would it have done if it was used judiciously? The whole BEE project has been disrupted. It has become a project for the few. It's become a project for the connected. It's not become a mass project, uh, which, which is what we said we would actually do. You had various legitimizing narratives, Bell Pottinger, and so on and so on and so on, including bots that are operating from India at the moment. So the minute, it's, I won't be surprised if I'm attacked in an hour's time, right? That's how it happens. Open your mouth, say something that is unfavorable to this clique, and they will then say how many shares I own in what. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it openly. Next thing, you'll be targeted as well if you take a stand. That's why you were scared of clapping earlier on. <laughs> We're having a bit of fun at least, so it's good. <laughs> the role of uh, the various uh, professionals is, is something that you need to look at as well. But underlying this, ladies and gentlemen, is the global phenomenon of the capitalist system, which is greed. So whether it's Pope Francis, or if you're an Anglican, Archbishop Wesley, or if you are any other religious or non-religious person, uh, read any analysis you like, greed is a driver of all this nonsense. Uh, it's happening on one scale here, it's happening on a much bigger scale elsewhere. So I think, is it in this morning's paper or last night, I can't remember. Uh, no, yeah, in the FT, uh, is an article where Rwanda, Tanzania, and one other country said they will stop the imports of secondhand clothing from the United States. Second-hand clothing, right? So people who export second-hand clothing from the United States want open access to these markets. These countries said, no, we're not willing to wear somebody else's clothes, okay? And Rwanda took the strongest of the stances uh, against the United States. Now, Rwanda is being threatened with uh, sanctions, inverted commas, uh, in terms of its access to Agoa and the opportunities that Agoa offers for exports to the United States. Second-hand clothing, 40,000 jobs they claim in the United States. I don't know where those jobs are. Even the Financial Times doesn't uh, give much credibility to it. So those of you who subscribe to that can actually read that article. It'll tell you something about what uh, greed drives you to actually do. So in conclusion, I think it's, it's, if I can share this with you, it's time to demonstrate that whilst we are all occupied with our own individual businesses and missions in life, we are at a stage in South Africa where we've got to put the country first. If you don't have a country, you're not going to have a company. Right? So if you don't, if you don't become participants in saving the country, where are you going to do your business? So you've got to put national interests first, and get the right mix between national and personal interests. We have to have the courage of our convictions to stand up and say, that's enough, we're gonna call you out, we're going to take active steps against corrupt practices, whether it is something that happened in the past or something that happens in the future. Like we say to big business, we also need enlightened self-interest, which is the point I'm making. That if you don't prevent certain things now, your own businesses won't progress later. Right? So that's enlightened self-interest. It's actually saying, think beyond your immediate requirements and, and ask how much better you, off you will be. This is something that, for example, the advanced economies don't understand, that soon Africa will have a billion and a half people. It's a huge market for them, potentially. Uh, even for ourselves, by the way. If every South African was living at a middle-class level, Right? That means you'll have so many more consumers in South Africa. That means we'll have, such a, we'll have a much bigger market in South Africa. 
That means our own firms won't have to say, I have to go into Africa first before I develop the market in our own country. Right? So, enlightened self-interest is the ability to think ahead of it and, and not within the parameters of one's immediate situation. But the key is what the President also calls the massification of transformation. A small group like us can't be the only beneficiaries uh, of the transformation process. So, whilst we benefit as the elite, semi-elite, how are we going to make sure that every South African has an asset? How are we going to make sure that they do get the title deeds to their houses, to land, and to whatever? How do we ensure that because of that asset that they have, they don't hand over poverty to the next generation, but hand over an asset to the next generation? And that's an ambition we should share. But also, can we use our creativity in the various affiliates of the BBC to come up with new ideas on how to massify transformation? We've talked about integrity and ethics in business. You tell me how to do that. And above all, uh, let's work together to build a better country, to make Tumamina a reality, and use the small opportunity we have of the new dawn. It might sound that it's full of clouds at the moment, but it is a new dawn. There are some opportunities that we need to utilize. It's all happening at a very difficult time globally. Oil prices going up, trade wars being threatened, contestation between American business and Chinese business taking place as it is, the Middle East being as unstable as it is, the emerging markets no longer being attractive, and you can see how all the emerging market currencies are depreciating at this point in time. Uh, you can see Argentina, 40% interest. So if you borrow money in Argentina, you'll be paying what, 45-50%? Right? That's what you'll be paying to borrow money in Argentina today. And they had to go to the IMF eh, and borrow $50 billion with conditionalities to reduce inflation, etc., etc., in order to save themselves from their current environment. We must have a singular determination not ever to end up there and sacrifice our sovereignty because a few people have decided to play mischief with our country. Thank you very much.